Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how's it going today? It's going great today, Tim. Fantastic, as a matter of fact. I hope everyone out there who is listening is feeling just as fantastic. We have a lot of authors, former law enforcement experts in their field, anyone who might have taken a case that they worked on or known somebody and wrote a book, and we'll have them on because, A... We love the book, and we want to make sure that others who enjoy true crime and want to be educated by true crime will read it. And B, we want to make sure that the author is successful and has their story told. What was really interesting about this is very quickly into the conversation, it didn't feel like this writer was promoting his book. He was telling a story... And the story was one that everyone knows about, but no one really knows the actual investigative story. But before we get to that, Tim, no one knows how you are, because I've just been going on and on. How are you? Thanks for asking. I'm doing great over here, Lance. I am really excited to introduce this conversation with author and former sheriff John Wesley Anderson, who has been working on the unsolved murder of John Bonet Ramsey. And of course, John Bonet Ramsey was murdered on Christmas night, 1996, in Boulder, Colorado. She was six years old at the time. Most people know this case. Lance and I mentioned to John before we started this conversation. That we really never did a deep dive on this case. So I feel like reading this new book, Lou and Jean Bonnet by John Wesley Anderson, and having this conversation with him is really the deep dive that we've never done. And you mentioned Lou in the title there, and that's Lou Smith. And he was one of the investigators who was working on Jean Bonnet's murder and eventually had to take a step back because of all of the inconsistencies and all of the lack of attention his evidence was getting. In order to get the full story, you do need to read the book, but this conversation with John is truly eye-opening, and it's a good prep for the book. Some of the details in this book are shocking. I can't believe Jean Bonnet Ramsey's murder is still unsolved after reading this book and speaking with John. I think Lou had it right, but that's just me. I'm not the Boulder Police. And John's got a couple of in-person author events. Friday, April 7th, 2023 at 4 p.m. He is speaking at the PPLD East Library in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And then on June 3rd, 2023 at 5 p.m., he is speaking at the A Church in Salida, Colorado. And we'd just like to emphasize that when you do pick up this book and you read it, please leave a good review on either Google or on Amazon. As John states towards the end of this interview, a good review goes a long way to get the rankings of the book higher, therefore spreading the story further. And Tim, for anyone who is listening to this and they just want this conversation to go straight through without any of those pesky ads, there must be a place where they can find them. There sure is. Listeners can now subscribe to Crawl Space Premium right there in their Apple Podcasts app. You get ad-free episodes, early releases, and our weekly bonus show, which people love. And if you're not an Apple user, you can go to crawlspace.supportingcast.fm and sign up for the exact same product there. And for all things going on in the crawl space world that is posted on social media, where can one find this? Folks can find us on social media at Crawl Space Podcast or Crawl Space Pod. Thanks a lot for listening, everybody. We're going to take a quick break here and we'll be right back with John Wesley Anderson. And a thank you to our sponsors. Back to the program. John Wesley Anderson, welcome to the podcast. How are you today? I'm well. Thank you, Tim. And Lance, I appreciate the opportunity to be on your show. We really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you because the work that you have done on your book about the John Benet Ramsey murder is absolutely remarkable. And we had talked a little bit off air about how Tim and I weren't really in the true crime industry, I guess you'd say, back when this happened. We had actually just, we were on the cusp of graduating high school and the murder happened and as we were just like teenagers, we didn't revisit it until we started doing true crime podcasting. And by that time, a lot of people had already talked about it. We were already working on other cases. So this really is like a 101 for us. But before we get into that, can you give uh, the listeners a bit of background on who you are and your history and how you came to this point in your life? 
I'm happy to. I began my law enforcement career right out of high school with the Colorado Springs Police Department, spent 22 and a half years there, and that's where I met Lou Smith. He was a homicide detective, and he was part of the reason I chose to go into the detective bureau after I'd been in patrol for about five years. And we worked together for six years as homicide detectives, partners. They had a lot of fascinating cases, and I talk a little bit about those in part one of three parts in the book. I don't want the book to be about me. I want it to be about Lou and John Bonet. This is their story. But I felt that first part were important to kind of communicate to people who Lou was and how uniquely qualified he was to be brought in to help assist in the investigation in 1997, shortly after the murder, and how I am, I guess, uniquely qualified to tell this story. Part two gets in, of the book gets into Lou's experience there in Boulder and his view of the physical evidence. And then part three talks a little bit about what our Smith family team has done, Lou and, and his family, along with several other uh, retired homicide detectives, uh, in trying to keep uh, the case alive to try to finish Lou's work. After I'd been on the police department over two decades, I ran for sheriff of our county, El Paso County, Colorado. On my first day in office, I brought Lou in as the captain of detectives and asked him not only to reorganize and lead the investigations division, but to focus on a cold case. That victim's name was Heather Dawn Church. She was 13 years old, kidnapped in her home in the Black Forest area of El Paso County. And four years later, the case was getting very little attention from the investigations division. Lou and I didn't have any jurisdiction until January 10, 1995. And that's when I was sworn as sheriff and brought him in and appointed him as the captain of detectives. And within 11 weeks, he had that kidnap murder solved. The suspect was in custody, pled guilty to the first degree murder. His name was Robert Charles Brown. B-R-W-N-E. By the time Lou and his team had finished, Brown had pled guilty to first-degree murder on that case and then also a second case. But he had also confessed to a total of 49 murders. And if true, that would make him certainly one of the most prolific serial killers in American history. I go into that detail to share a little bit about Lou's experience in investigations was really kind of unique because he had 30 years of experience. He had worked not only at the sheriff's office as a detective, he had been with the the coroner's office here in El Paso County, the district attorney's office. And that's one of the reasons I recommended him to the Boulder district attorney, Alex Hunter, in 97, to encourage the DA's office to take advantage of Lou's experience. So when I retired from the sheriff's office, I was term limited in uh, 2003. So I had 30 years career in law enforcement. Then I went into the corporate world and uh, spent 10 years with um, Lockheed Martin, large defense contractor, primarily corporate security, homeland security, homeland defense. That was a unique experience. Lou and I remained in close touch. He was he was my best friend, best man at my wedding. Uh, I talk a little bit about that in the book. When he went to work for the DA's office, I was still in the corporate world. We met shortly after he started there. And that's the first inkling that I had that there was something wrong in the investigation. And I'll never forget his first conversation. This was in 1997, probably in early April. I said, well, how How's things going in Boulder? And he said, well, there's something really wrong with this case, Johnny. And he, he he always called me Johnny. And he started talking about how the information that had been revealed by the media and the tabloids in particular was not matching what the truth was. And that some of what the Boulder police was making uh, statements on was not accurate either. And he had concern because that's not at all how we spent our time in law enforcement. You never deceive the public. You never uh, put out false information. And uh, you try to, you know, investigate a case, you know, objectively. And, you know, it is a process, exclusion and inclusion. And certainly, uh, you know, you have to look at, you know, the immediate family. But Lou early on saw evidence of an intruder and tried to bring that evidence to the forefront with the Boulder detectives, Boulder Police Department detectives. And he was really uh, chastised. Um, he was not going along with the uh, common theme that, you know, the Ramses did it. The more he pointed out the physical evidence that supported the idea of a, a intruder coming into the home through a, a broken basement window, items in the home that had to have been brought into the crime scene, introduced by the killer, and what was taken out of the, the home afterwards as well. And we can go into more detail here in a little bit on that. But to get to the end of this introduction and this little narrative and get to your guys' more specific questions, I think what Lou saw was an inexperienced team of detectives who were unwilling to accept any offers of outside assistance. And if there was any references 
to anyone other than the Ramseys having been involved in the murder, that information was just simply ignored. And one of the most telling parts was the DNA report from the Carl Beer Investigation, CBI, that was available on January 15th, within three weeks of the murder. And that uh, DNA report excluded 10 people to include all members of the immediate Ramsey family. And that's what Lou just couldn't understand. That document was withheld by the police department for seven months before it was turned over to the DA's office. It's, of course, a very critical piece of evidence. And it's one of the things that I decided in this book that it needed to be brought out, because if it's not brought out now, how will it ever come out? Why was it withheld? Well, that's a great question. And it probably doesn't help to speculate. That's the only way I can answer this. The evidence didn't go along with the theory that was being professed by the Boulder police all the way up to the chain of command to the chief that the um, parents were not cooperative, which was a lie. They did have Patsy's blood on the fourth day after the murder that was either inadvertently or intentionally misrepresented in a, a public information announcement that was put out on uh, December 30th of 1996 by the public information officer with the Boulder Police Department who made a statement. There's dozens of reporters in the room who are reporting this all over the nation, perhaps all over the world. The PIO statement was, we do have blood from the family and some other evidence samples, except for Patsy. And then she makes the comment offhand that perhaps Patsy was just too distraught, you know, to provide the information. We know from looking at that report, that two-page report from the CBI, on the same day she's making that statement, December 30th, 1996, that that's either an inherent lie or a misrepresentation. But in my background with 30 years in law enforcement, if we made a misstatement, we immediately corrected it. You immediately put out a, a public correction. And there were probably detectives in that room during the press conference who knew that that was not correct and let it go. And so by it not being corrected, it certainly draws the impression that that was an intentional, deliberate misrepresentation of the evidence. And according to John Ramsey, John Bonet's dad, that was purposely done to force the parents through through extreme pressure to confess, admit, you know, that one of the other ones in the family did this. So here's a, a family who's going through the tragedy of losing a six-year-old loved one, trying to make arrangements for her funeral. And this is also appalling that there was an attempt from the commander of the investigations division to ask the coroner to withheld that little girl's body to keep the parents from being able to continue on with the funeral arrangements to be done in Atlanta, Georgia, where the family was from, because the parents weren't cooperating. Throughout that investigation, there were terrible mistakes made, unethical mistakes made, in my opinion. If nothing else, I hope that what this book does is remove the umbrella of suspicion that the family has lived under. And that's a quote from the police chief in Boulder. I think the book, beyond any reasonable doubt, should establish the evidence is there to eliminate the Ramsey family. But secondly, I hope that the book also shows how this case, even after 26 years, is still solvable through the evidence that was there. The DNA is not perfect, but it is good enough to exclude people of interest and the technology continues to evolve, but the databases are growing exponentially too. And so that's why the Smith family team and I do believe that there's never been a better time to solve this case. All we need is some law enforcement authority with the jurisdiction and the conviction to pursue uh, justice for John Bonet. I'm curious if you can take us back to the moments leading up to the discovery of John Bonet's body based on your relationship and what conclusions Lou came to. I really liked his approach when he said that he didn't have an allegiance towards the family or towards this theory or that theory. He had an allegiance towards the case. Based on your work with him, what was his theory about the moments leading up to the discovery of the body? He knew that there was um, a compromised crime scene from the moment the first officer stepped on the, the property, was handed the ransom note, handled it, handed it back to the family, who ended up passing around to other neighbors and friends. And then when detectives showed up, they handled it. So there was an opportunity lost from the first moment the first officer arrived on the scene. One of the biggest failures was not securing that crime scene. 911 call was very clear, and Lou had uh, copies of that recording of the 911 call when Patsy called the 911 dispatcher at Boulder Police Department. This is about 5 a.m., 
on the morning of December 26, 1996. So it's the morning after Christmas. The officers knew that they were dispatched on a kidnapping. They get there. The parents are frantic. Their daughter's missing. She was in the bedroom uh, upstairs on the second level. They sleep on the third level. The officer searches the house. The first officer was in the basement, and the basement was only a partial basement. So there's only like four or five rooms there. And he admits to standing right in front of the door that led into what was referred to as a wine cellar. Technically, wasn't a wine cellar. There wasn't a wine in there, but that's where uh, the victim's body was found laying on the floor. And he admits that he looked at the door. There was a little wooden latch at the top where it was locked, and he just dismissed the idea that you know anybody could be in there. So that continues to compound things in errors. But it wasn't just that officer, because there's other uh, patrol officers who come, there's sergeants that come, there's crime scene de- detectives who arrive, crime scene technicians. The house is full of police officers, first responders, who are supposedly searching for this little girl, and they don't even look in in all of the rooms. And, of course, that goes against not only law enforcement training, you know, it goes against common sense. If you're looking for a a lost six-year-old little girl, you want to look for wherever she could be hiding. You know, she might be under the bed, she could be in the clothes hamper, who knows? But there could also be a bad guy in the house. So if you're a police officer, you're trained not to, to let them get at your back. So you always search the rooms to make sure there's not a, a suspect. Otherwise, you're exposing yourself and one of the other officers. So it's really inexcusable the way that it was handled from the very beginning. I think there's still mistakes being being made, but perhaps the biggest mistake, and, and John Ramsey sa- says this best, is that you know he can overlook them not being experienced and being poorly supervised or whatever, but what he can't excuse is their refusal to uh, accept the help that was offered. The FBI was allowed to put up a phone trace in case the kidnapper called in. They were going to trace the call. The FBI has extraordinary resources. And on a crime of this nature, they should have been allowed into the crime scene. They were kept out. One of the nearest major law enforcement agencies to Boulder, Colorado, is the Denver Police Department. Denver is a large city, and they have an extraordinarily experienced and capable investigations division. Denver Police offered the Boulder Police two full-time homicide detectives to be part of their team for free. And whether it was arrogance, who knows? Nobody will know why. But the, those offers of assistance were refused. And ha- I believe had, and Lou believed this too, had there been experienced homicide detectives there that first morning or any time during that day, almost certainly the body would have been found. It wouldn't have had to have been found by the father. That case might have been solved within the first few days. What was the evidence of the crime scene? Evidence of an intruder. What Lou understood, and we talked about this many times on dozens and dozens of homicides, the investigative principle of what's referred to as the transfer theory or the theory of interchange. And that was first developed in 1877 by Professor uh, Lockhart. And so sometimes it's referred to as Lockhart's L-O-C-A-R-T, theory of interchange. But what the transfer theory means is that whenever a crime is committed, the suspect either takes something or leaves something at the scene. And that's the basic principle of your physical evidence in any crime scene investigation. So in this case, what Lou did was he spent a great deal of time going through the crime scene photographs, autopsy photographs, revisiting the crime scene, talking to anybody involved to include uh, John and Patsy Ramsey. And what he came to conclude is that the items of evidence that the intruder had to have brought into the home, because these items didn't exist in the home, included the white parachute cord that's referred to as para cord uh, 550. Parents never owned parachute cord. They didn't even know what it was. But the killer brought that cord into the house. He, he introduced that, used it to tie up the little girl, um, her wrists, He also fashioned the garrot out of it, and the garrot handle was fabricated by the killer in place while he's controlling the little girl. And the way Lou knew that is a little bit of her hair, her blonde hair, was in the knot of the the garrot that's being fashioned. So here's a, a killer who is holding this little girl controlling her with the slip knots tied around her wrist so that the more she struggled, the more tighter the restraints would become and fashions this garrote in place with what's available. In addition, he had placed a strip of black duct tape over her mouth to prevent her from screaming. And what Lou pointed out is says, if you look at that duct tape, it's not cut on both ends. Both ends are torn and there was no black duct tape, a roll of duct tape in the house. So Lou believed the killer had to have brought that 
roll the duct tape in, tore a piece off, put it over her mouth, and since it was not left at the crime scene, took that roll of duct tape with him. Had they been able to find the duct tape soon enough, you might have been able to match that serrated, that torn edge of the last piece that was on her, her mouth. Or, and the detectives did do this after the fact, searched the entire Ramsey house for any use of duct tape on appliances, on backs of picture frames, plumbing, or, or anything and didn't find any black duct tape anywhere. But had they been able to do that, they should have been able to match those ends. One of the other most convincing pieces of physical evidence to Lou was evidence that the little girl was stun gunned. And he pointed to two marks on her face on the right side of her jaw, just below her ear, and two marks on her back that were 35 millimeters, 3.5 centimeters in distance apart. Both of the marks where the metal probes came in contact with the skin left a rectangular reddish abrasion, uh, like a thermal injury. Lou, who was an expert in wound pattern interpretation, not only from being a homicide detective, from being in the coroner's office and then in the district attorney's office in El Paso County as an investigative detective for the prosecutors. So he understood wound pattern interpretation. And when he asked the Ramses, do you own a stun gun? Well, no. Do you know anybody that has a stun gun? No. Lou was on to something because that stun gun had to have been brought into that home by the killer with the intent to immobilize someone in that home. Lou thought probably the first use of the stun gun was when John Bonet's upstairs in her bedroom. He thought the sequence of events was probably to put the duct tape across her mouth to keep her from screaming, stun gunning her to incapacitate her, and then take her down to the basement. Another a fairly critical piece of evidence was an unidentified footprint near John Bonet's body and the impression on the floor and the debris on the floor, on the concrete floor in the basement. You could read it. It's backwards, but it said high tech, H-I dash T-E-C. Supposedly, all the police officers, first responders, crime lab people, and the entire Ramsey household was searched for any high tech footwear, and there was none. So Lou believed the parachute cord, the stun gun, the duct tape, what all that comes to is a kidnapping kit. This guy put together a kidnapping kit purposely to kidnap somebody in that home. So what Lou said is what we're seeing on the ransom note is from this killer. And Lou believed she, that John Money was almost certainly alive at the time the ransom note was written, just from reading it. But it was such an unusual note. Now, I do know that uh, some of the uh, police came to the conclusion early that, oh, Patsy wrote that note. But Lou spent a lot of time with other uh, forensic examiners, handwriting experts, who said either they're not able to say that Patsy wrote it, but some said, well, we can't exclude her. I think one or two said that. Instead of saying, well, we can't exclude Patsy, it gets misinterpreted, well, Patsy may have written the note, to, oh, Patsy wrote the note. But of significance is the uh, forensic examiner that Lou identifies, and it's in, in my book, um, who was an experienced uh, question document examiner with the U.S. Secret Service. And he came out publicly and said, no, in his expert opinion, Patsy Ramsey is not the author of that note. Now, why that's so important is here's a piece of physical evidence that denies that, you know, the Ramseys were involved and he tried to correct while he was alive this misinterpretation that Patsy wrote the note. He also points out why that is such an invaluable piece of information to have is when Patsy and John both take their polygraph examinations and they pass the examinations, they're asked specifically, do you know who killed John Bonet? No, they pass those questions. But Patsy is asked the question, did you write the ransom note? And she says no. And she passes that question on the polygraph. Now, people are going to be quick to say, oh, you know, polygraphs, they're not admissible in court. Turn that around, though. Had John or and Patsy failed the polygraph, everybody would be saying, see, you know, knew that they were guilty all along. But what Lou did was go through extraordinary length on each piece of physical evidence from the stun gun, buying a pig, a full-grown pig, and having it euthanized and getting a coroner to use the stun gun on the pig to reach the medical conclusion and render his expert opinion 
that it was a stun gun mark that was on John Bonet. Whatever Lou continued to do on his own time and his own expense, he made that available to the Boulder Police Department, in some cases the Boulder DA. It was completely ignored. They argued that, you know, it's not a stun gun. I personally experienced that. Our Smith family team met with the Boulder detectives. The last time that I brought up the stun gun, uh, I was told by uh, Commander Tom Trujillo, who was at the autopsy and took photographs uh, along the crime lab of the stun gun injuries as well as other injuries. They said, no, I don't agree with Smith. And I said, well, they sure look like they match the other evidence that uh, stun gun was used. And Tom told me, he says, no, no, you had to be there. You had to be in there and see him, you know, real. And they're not stun gun marks. Well, they were. And that, I think, does come out in the book beyond any reasonable doubt that a stun gun was used. All of this to say, Boulder police have been wrong. The detectives have been off base in trying to pin this murder on this family. And if they get off of that, or some law enforcement agency gets off that, as Lou would say, you know, follow the evidence. Where is the evidence leading? Well, the evidence is leading to an intruder. And the DNA has identified an unknown male who left his DNA and genetic material on the victim's body and on her clothing. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. The person that you referenced who ran the analysis on the ransom note, is that the one that you're speaking about in the book, the former forensic expert with the Secret Service? Yes. Uh, Richard Dursick was his name. And then you just mentioned how Lou would say, follow the evidence. It's just so remarkable to me. We're not talking about a crime that happened in the 1800s. How is it so clearly not the parents with forensic evidence, the DNA evidence, the evidence that you see at the crime scene? That's what Lou couldn't understand either, is how can you continue to to focus on the family, on the parents. And the quote again they had was that the parents were under an umbrella of suspicion. John Ramsey points out in his book that he and Patsy came immediately to conclude it wasn't an umbrella of suspicion. It was a parasol of persecution, which was a, a great quote, but that's what they felt. And they need to be held accountable, which is what I hope the book does. And there needs to be consequences, but that's secondary. The primary thing is solving this case and identifying whoever that unknown male DNA belongs to and see where he is at. That's the person that needs to be held accountable. But there are some people, probably within the Boulder Police Department, who will never believe it's not the Ramsey family until this killer is caught. Some people say, oh, this isn't a DNA case. Well, yeah, it is. <laughs> it's not the only piece of evidence, it, but it, it's going to help identify who the killer is. Lou left a long list of potential persons of interest, and that's what we, the Smith family team, have been using the last 12 years since Lou passed away to eliminate people. There's um, clearly sufficient evidence to say who's not the suspect and potentially in retesting, you know, some of the physical evidence, there might be further genetic material that might lead to a, a DNA identification through familial DNA. But we see almost every week now cases that are 30 or 40 years old, cold cases across the country being solved. The technology is getting better. The databases are expanding. There's getting to be more and more of an interest with law enforcement in using this technology. And hopefully what the book does is, is kind of force that to come about. And I'm curious, as a 30-year law enforcement veteran like yourself, it must pain you a little bit to feel like you need to criticize Boulder police. And I did do that lightly, and I take no enjoyment in it. Yeah, if anything, it's embarrassing professionally. Uh, I suppose any profession, whether you're a medical doctor and you see someone who is doing some medical malpractice or whatever, I think at some point you have to say enough's enough. We tried to uh, reason with Boulder Police. We tried to help get them on the right track. We tried to lend them our support. And I shouldn't lump all Boulder Police together. What I should do is say there's that's a great organization. I know and knew some of the police officers there. For the most part, they're very uh, sophisticated, well-educated, intelligent. They're one of the first police departments, at least in Colorado, that required a four-year undergraduate degree. It's a smaller community. It's the capital of Colorado, so it's, it's a large metropolitan area. But Boulder, as a small college town, did not have a lot of violent crimes. It might be a good place to, to live. It didn't develop a lot of experienced detectives, which is okay, as long as you, you know, in a case like this, accept help that's offered. In your experience, have you ever seen a family treated worse by, by the police and the media? I have not. And that's 
one of the terrible injustices that I hope the book points out, and if nothing else, there should be lessons learned in this case for law enforcement agencies, as well as best practices adopted. Lou had some extraordinary best practices. His note-taking, his meticulous attention to detail, his objectivity, uh, his thoroughness is just, well, legendary, which is part of the, the title of the book is. You know, if it's okay, I, I'd like to mention the uh, title of the book is um, uh, Lou and John Bonet, A Legendary Lawman's Quest to Solve the Murder of a Child Beauty Queen. Lou never saw John Bonet as a beauty queen. He saw her as an innocent six-year-old little girl, a little kindergartner, her like riding her bike. And Lou had three uh, daughters of his own. I think that might have been early on in the investigation, something that the tabloids, maybe the law enforcement fixated on, you know, the beauty pageant, which was really just a very small part of John Bonet's life. It was a different set of circumstances since her mother, Patsy, was a former Miss America, and they enjoyed that. That was something that uh, John Ramsey and I talked about. It wasn't like, you know, the parents, you know, said, oh, you're going to go do this. Uh, it was more like it was something she loved to do and sharing that with her mother. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's up to the parents to decide. But but I think some people turn that around. So the reason I, I mentioned that is on the cover of the book, what I wanted to make sure that we did, and I've got a little card here of it to, to show, I wanted to make sure that she was not portrayed in one of those glamour shots that the tabloids uh, exploited. The photo has two important photos, and any book or any story is about people, places, and events. That's what makes the, the story. In this case, there are two firsts. The first day that Lou started on the sheriff's office working for me as my captain detectives, that's the photo of Lou on the cover of the book. Knowing Lou, it might have been the only time he was ever photographed in uniform, because he usually wore a suit and tie. The photo with John Bonet is important. That was a first. It was her first day of going to kindergarten and her mother Patsy took that photograph. John Bonet never finishes kindergarten and within four years Patsy's gone. And when I was working with my publisher, Wild Blue Press, for the cover art, I said, you know, there's really two photos I'd love to get on there. This one is my favorite, one of my favorites of Lou. I had a different photograph of uh, John Bonet that I had found in Lou's case file. And it was a kindergarten, like a class photo. And I sent the uh, cover art to John Ramsey, John Bonet's dad. And I, and I said, hey, I, I just want to keep in touch. This is the book cover is probably going to look like. What do you think? And and he was nice. He emailed back that evening and he says, well, it, it looks nice and that's a good photograph of um, John Bonet. But he said, you know, there's one I like better. And so he sent me that photo, uh, which is one of his favorite photos of his daughter. That poor guy. Not a lot of people know about his other daughter that died in the car accident. All right. You had to lose both your daughters and then your wife. Yeah. The first time looking at that cover and seeing the picture of John Bonet not being the one that you've seen in the tabloids and the newspapers where she's dolled up in the beauty contest, in the back of my mind, it did occur to me and I thought, oh, I've never seen her like that. And it was such a media-driven thing back then. John Ramsey talks about this publicly and it's mentioned in the book, their book, Death of Innocence that this was just something that she enjoyed doing, something that Patsy um, enjoyed sharing. Patsy was in, uh, she was in remission from cancer. And I think anybody who's gone through that probably is aware that, um, you know, that can return at any time. And what I think listening to John Ramsey explain when John Bonet got older, then those beauty contests might even be more important. But what, what Patsy probably realized is that she's probably never going to be able to live long enough, you know, to enjoy that with her daughter, you know, when she's in college. So what John said is that he believes Patsy tried to squeeze everything into the life that she had to share with uh, her daughter. Wow, that's so tragic. I want to ask about the killer's intentions in, in your opinion and Lou's opinion. I think it, it sounds like the killer intended to kidnap Jean Bonnet, took her down to the basement, and am I mistaken, he tried to get her out of the house, most likely, in a suitcase? Yeah, that was Lou's assumption. I think he was probably right. The two-and-a-half-page ransom note, you know, obviously the killer's taking time to do that. It's very calculated. Lou believed that the killer was in the house earlier that evening uh, waiting for the family, the Ramsey family, to return 
to the home. They had gone to a family friend's Christmas dinner. That family had uh, children that were John Bonet and her nine year old brother Burke's age. So the kids liked playing with one another. And Lou showed photographs from the crime scene that led him to believe that the suspect had entered the home through that broken window and had waited, likely in the upstairs bedroom, a guest bedroom. It was a bedroom that was used by the older brother, John Andrew, but he had gone off to college, so they turned into a guest bedroom. But it was very near where uh, John Benet's bedroom was at. Burke's, the nine-year-old brother, his bedroom was on that same level, just a little bit further down the hall. But Lou showed uh, photographs of the crime scene that was taken that morning that showed a couple of things that were out of place. The dust ruffle around the bottom of the bed. The housekeeper or the mother, I don't know who made the beds up, had tucked the dust ruffle underneath the bottom of it. So Lou pointed out how uh, the edges of the dust ruffle were tucked underneath, except for the end of the bed, and about half of that dust ruffle was out. And Lou believed that that was where the suspect crawled out from underneath the bed where he'd been hiding. The other thing Lou pointed out was that that bedroom, when you looked out the window, it faced the back alley, and that's where the garage door was at. So when the parents would come home, they would enter the home through the garage, which is what they did, but the killer would be able to know when they when they came in. Also in that uh, bedroom, Lou pointed out a sack with some rope in it that seemed really out of place, but also in the bathroom that was adjoining that guest bedroom. The uh, drawers of the sink and the counter uh, beneath the mirror, that each of the drawers had been pulled out and left out uh, 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 several inches. So what Luke concluded was the, the killer, the kidnapper, had waited in that room watching you know, for the family to return. So he was convinced that the killer had gotten in ahead of time, had probably written the note while he's waiting for them to come home. And then as he abducted John Bonet after she'd been put to bed, the parents are asleep, takes her to the, the basement. Lou believed he intended to try to get her out of the home, possibly using that large green suitcase. Part of Lou's belief was is inside the suitcase was a Dr. Seuss book, which was one of John Bonet's favorite books, a duvet, kind of a, a rap thing. Lou theorized that if he had her in the suitcase and was trying to get her out of the out of the home, it would be almost impossible to lift her up through that window well. Uh, the suitcase was too large and it was just cumbersome because if you've got the suitcase up into the window well, where are you going to stand if you're trying to crawl out too? So Lou believed that was evidence of an attempt to remove her while well, she's still alive from the uh, home. And when that failed, he changed his, his mind. And, and that's when the, uh, the assault occurs. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsor. And a thank you to our sponsors. Back to the program. How is this person not in CODIS? How in the world is this person not in CODIS? Well, that's a great question. And we're, we're told he is. But CODIS is not uh, perfect. And uh, it depends on a lot of different factors. When was the entry made? How confident are we that the best CODIS entries went in? CODIS is not all inclusive because what we do know in some cases, at least in Colorado, is when a suspect is arrested and convicted of a sexual assault goes into the Colorado Department of Corrections today, then his DNA is collected and run through a CODIS. But if he was arrested on other minor offenses, or if he was arrested before some of those laws were enacted, then there's a possibility that he could have been in custody, you know, state prison somewhere. I point out a case in Colorado, a cold case, where the suspect had been arrested, convicted on two very violent uh, sexual assault rapes, and was in the Department of Corrections, and we didn't get his DNA until he was up for parole. And as he was being released, then the cold case detectives with the Colorado Springs Police Department, where I had formerly worked as a detective with Lou, the cold case detectives were able to uh, say, wait a minute, you know, this, this is a match, and we got a match through CODIS. So again, why didn't he get a match, you know, when he went in? Well, the system may not have been in place. It may not have been a robust. There might have been a different type of a standard that was being used because 26 years ago, the DNA was not our first priority because, you know, we were really in its infancy. Over the last quarter century, it's continued to evolve and get better. It's a valid question, Tim. What was the state of the 
CODIS 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Well, it's certainly not where it is today. So what one of the things that we've encouraged Boulder detectives or Boulder DA or somebody, anybody who has access to law enforcement databases or private databases, we should be running not just this case, but all unsolved cases. That's what happened with the Golden State Killer in California, is once they finally got that killer's DNA, it opened up all of these other cases. I think they ended up with nine homicide convictions. And this tragedy in that case was there were dozens and dozens of sexual assaults and and burglaries that um, violent crimes that the statute of limitations had expired on. I think, Tim and Lance, one of the things that, and maybe you guys have a role in this with your listenership, is at some point, we, society, need to really come to grips of where does my personal right to privacy conflict with the public's right to safety and security. And I'm not saying, you know, we ought to be taking DNA from every, you know, child, baby that's born for now and or forever. But I am saying we need to rethink, are we really protecting the criminal with our policies or are we trying to protect victims like John Bonet? If nothing else, we should be looking, we law enforcement should be looking at exploiting all potential DNA to include private DNA databases, 23andMe, Ancestry.com. Those are bigger as far as numbers of people and entries than law enforcement databases. They're bigger than CODIS, and they're growing at a much faster rate than CODIS. I think there's ways of protecting people's identity, you know, by saying, we're going to give you a number, Tim. You're going to be whatever number it is, and we're not going to use your name and date of birth or your number or whatever until there's a match in Tennessee <laughs> to a murder or a violent crime. Then we're, we need to know who that number associates with. I think there's ways of protecting confidentiality. That's what we did in law enforcement with, you know, confidential informants. We'd give them a number and we wouldn't release that number. We would only refer to that person by the number. I think what we really need to do in, in America is rethink our use of DNA to include familial DNA. And I totally agree with that. There's ways that this can be done where you're not giving out all of your personal details and we can put these guidelines in place so you're not going to just get picked up for some random crime somewhere and the DNA is all confused and everything. Like there's ways to do this. Early identification, rapid incapacitation of violent offenders. That's what the focus of society needs to be. And in law enforcement, let's not wait until there's a string, you know, like in the Golden case state case, you know, where we've got nine murders. Let's do everything we can on that very first violent crime to solve that case, to identify the killer, take them immediately, rapidly out of the community. That's what leads to public safety. And I think, again, the technology evolved to the point that there needs to be some serious rethinking, protecting somebody's, you know, privacy at the expense of the public's safety. 100% agree. I am shocked to learn this person may be in CODIS, the killer were able to sort of call an audible while in the house and fashion such a dangerous weapon and assault this young girl, murder her, and then get away with this for so long. I am outraged at this. Well, I'm glad to hear, and it's one of the challenges. What point do you go too far in sharing the violent details? But I think so many people, to include maybe people with the Bowler police who were under the misperception that, oh, Patsy accidentally may have killed John Benet and then, you know, covered this up by, you know, staging a kidnap, you know, for ransom. That's just nonsense. Because when you look at the violence of this sexual assault and the way it was executed, this was not an attempt to cover up an accidental death. This was the, the work of a very violent pedophile who is or was a very evil person. And until that gets exposed, people can still, you know, have the misperception that, oh, no, no, you know, they tied her up and you know, whatever, you know, to make it look like an accident. No, that's not it at all. And, and I did struggle as an author and as a law enforcement professional. Do I cross the line in trying to explain that? I did have many discussions with my publisher, wildbluepress.com, who was very responsible in looking at what photographs are we going to put in the book. All the photos are Lou Smith's original slides. 
that he put together, how many and which ones do we want to make sure we don't put in there because we, we want to be respectful to the family. There's an additional 20 photos that are not in the book that are on the website in a photo gallery, Lou Smith's uh, slides. So there's a total of 56 photos. We tried to, again, as responsible as we could, show things like, you know, well, how was she tied up, the slip knots? So there are some photographs there. They're intended for mature adult audiences. There are pictures of the uh, wound patterns from the stun gun. We purposely withheld the more shocking autopsy photos and things out of respect for the family. So there was a real discussion challenge and a discussion with a publisher, which ones are we going to put in the book? Which ones are we going to make available online? To put that in perspective, Lou had 632 slides that he had prepared that explained this case. So we have less than 10%. Uh, 90% of, of his slide presentation is withheld. In addition to that, he had a spreadsheet that he had worked on for years that had 883 entries in 54 columns. And so there's like over 47,000 cells on this huge spreadsheet, massive spreadsheet. Not every cell is populated, but some of the cells had dual information. Like it might have a person's name or um, a, a, a reference to the garage or something. And then when you clicked on that entry, it would lead you to an explanation who that person was or what that physical evidence was about. It, incredible detail that he had put together. When he knew he was going into hospice and he knew he was running out of time, he wanted to make sure that this case didn't die with him. And he tried to leave it in the best condition he could so that someone would pick it up and run with it. It's a tragedy. We've had to wait 12, almost 13 years now to try to get to this point of bringing the public's attention to this failed investigation. And hopefully, again, the book and, and through your efforts and others like you, maybe get some movement on the investigation. If people are interested in helping, there's two things they can do. One is the Smith family team. When we first started doing this, we have to pay for the DNA because we have to pay it on our own. We're not no longer in law enforcement, so we don't have access. So we had to hire privately the DNA private labs and pay for that. So the first several we did, we just had to pass the hat. And, and if we were doing any travel or expenses, we just paid our own expenses. None of us in the team have ever gotten paid. A few years ago, when we decided, the Smith family decided, that we're going to come out from the shadows and let people know what we're doing. One of Lou's daughters was able to establish a GoFundMe. And so what we're able to do now is instead of paying for the DNA testing or the travel, if we have to fly somewhere to try to uh, pick up the DNA or get a sample, then we always use our own personal credit cards, but we'll turn in our receipt for a travel or a hotel. One thing people can do is if they're interested in helping is go to the, the GoFundMe page for John Bonet that was set up by the Smith family and make a donation there. That would be very much appreciated. And then the other thing is, is with this book, not to be coming across as commercial or an advertisement, but, but the more people who learn this story, that hear this story, read about this story, the more action that can be taken, whether that's bringing attention to policies that need to be changed, pressure that it needs to be brought on the governor of Colorado, on the Boulder Police Department, on Boulder DA's office or whatever, how that the story will help get out is through people doing a review, particularly on, on Amazon. If they think the book is, is worthy, then um, give a, a positive review. And the more of those reviews, you guys know how this works, it goes up in, in rankings. And so what we're trying to do is, is get as many reviews as possible within the next few days so that those rankings and that the book gets more exposure, the story gets more exposure. And that's that's another thing people could do if they're wanting to help. In researching Lou Smith, on Wikipedia, it says that he fell just short of the department's minimum height of five feet, nine inches, but was able to join the force because he had his cousin hit him over the head with a nightstick. So he had a bump. And when he measured in, he, he met the requirements. Is that true? That's absolutely true. And uh, his cousin, Bill Feedy, uh, who's passed on now, and Lou, they used to laugh about that all the time. And I remember one of the things Lou <laughs> talked about was when he first asked Bill, his cousin, to whack him over the head the night before he was to be measured. Bill said, I'm not going to do that. He says, no, no, no. He says, hit me right here, right on top of the head, as hard as you can. And so Bill whacked him. And uh, uh, Lou, 
Lou's feeling. He says, that's not hard enough. You've got to do it again. And Bill says, I'm not hitting you again. <laughs> he says, yeah, he says, you've got to hit me one more time, only harder this time. And so Lou, if you can imagine, winces, he closes his eyes, and Bill whacked him as hard as he could, so he didn't want to do it another a third time. But sure enough, yeah, that bump, you know, uh, was on the top of Lou's head the next day when he's measured. Now, now the, the irony is, you know, we don't have a minimum, you know, height or weight, you know, with the police department uh, uh, because, you know, it just didn't make a lot of sense. If you were, you know, five, eight and a half, you could be a <laughs> wonderful police officer or five, two or five, six. <laughs> but at the time, that's what we had. Yeah, that's a true, that's a true story. I can attest to that. That's a true story. Well, John, thank you so much for joining us here today. We really appreciate your time and your work on this case and this book. We desperately want to see justice for John Bonet and we will be there pushing with you. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Lance. It, it's obvious you guys care. We appreciate you sharing this story and getting the truth out there. Thank you.